Last week, last week we began something that we didn't finish. Amen. We began uh, a, a discussion on redeeming our childhood. Someone say redeeming my childhood, and 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 we did a good a good discussion on it, but we we did, we we never finished. So we are we are going to finish it today. Amen. Bible says in Proverbs chapter twenty two verse six. Um, that train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he grows, he will not depart from it, right? And so it doesn't matter what the training is. The training can be good, and the child will not depart from it when they are older. The training can be bad, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you will not depart from it either, uh, because that is the foundation of your life. And the Bible says that unless ye be like children, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And the Bible says that suffer the children to come unto me, and for be them not for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Somebody say amen. And so God wants us to be like a child, to laugh and to rejoice and to trust and to depend on him again. Somebody say amen. You can be so adulthood and, 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 uh, and so grown up that you can no longer trust God. And they say, God, I got this myself. No, I, I encourage you to live a life of fully dependent on God, fully leaning on Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. I mentioned five things, and I'm just going to go through it real fast, about things that may have happened to you as a child. One, two, or more may have happened. Uh, some of us grew up too fast. We grew up way too fast. So now we are overwhelmed with responsibility. All we know is responsibility. Things must get done. Let's get done. Uh, pastor says, let's fix the chairs. Why are you guys laughing whilst we are fixing the chairs? It is time to work, people. Okay, calm down. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You are so responsibility focused um, that you have lost the joy of serving. You have lost the joy of just enjoying life uh, and being able to still accomplish the task. When that happens with, with uh, overwhelming responsibility as a child, you lose emotion. You no longer have the emotion, the, the joy, the smile, all of that is like nobody has time for that. Got work. Lose that. Somebody say amen. And then you also become very, very um, performance driven. You have to perform to get approval. Because when the responsibility came, they only clapped for you when, when you did work. You were not clapped for and encouraged and loved just because of you. You were encouraged and, 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 and applauded because you did something. So the rest of your life, you have developed this mentality of I have to do something. And you take it to God. And God says, just rest in my presence. Like, no, 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 God. So you end up you do, doing things, busy about doing things uh, and being like a Martha instead of a Mary. Now you have become, now, now, now you, have, you, have, you, you have forgotten the Lord of the work. And been busy with the work of the Lord. You get it, it becomes an idol in your life, and your and your affirmation and your confidence comes when when something you do in church or something you do in life goes well. You're like, yes, I am somebody. The moment something little goes wrong, I am nobody because your value is tied to what you do. All right. The second thing that happened to some of us as a child is that uh, innocence was was taken away. Abuse or knowing or seeing something you shouldn't have seen was taken away from you. And so now everything, everything is mature. Everything goes faster than it's supposed to be. You can no longer uh, be, 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 be innocent and gentle. You always have an opinion on something. You, you always have a warped perspective and because something that is meant to be innocent is always translated as not innocent. You see what I'm saying? Someone can say a, a simple joke like, what do you mean by that? Oh, I, 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 just, I just meant it in what it was. But because innocence is taken away, you no longer see anything with the eyes of innocence. Everything has to be interpreted. There's always something behind something. I know what you said, but I know what you meant. No, no, I meant what I said. Oh, no, no, no. no. I know, no, there's no more to what I'm saying than what I said. That's what happens when childhood Innocence is taken away. Trust becomes an issue, eh? Mm. This too happens. When innocence is taken away, uh, you have the need to know. 
You, can, you just can't trust not knowing. Where do you go? Who you talk to? Who you phone with? What's happening? So I saw you raise your hands in the church. You raise your hands the very moment that brother raises his hands. What's going on? Uh, yeah, exactly. Paranoia sets in because innocence is gone. When innocence is gone, everything becomes suspicious. I got to know. So, so, yeah, your phone rang three times last night. What was that? Oh, it was my boss. Are you sure? Innocence is gone. When innocence is gone, you are suspicious of everything. And, and you lose the very nature of a child that is trusting and hopeful. Children believe anything. They believe anything you tell them, you know, to the point that I can use milk as hostage for my children. Somebody say amen. You can tell them if you don't drink all your milk, we cannot go to vacation. No, daddy, no. Because in their mind, the money for the milk is enough to pay for the vacation. <laughs> That's innocence, I'm saying. That's innocence. And if you grow up too fast or if innocence is taken away, you are, you are judgmental in everything. You've lost the very purity of life. Somebody say amen. And I think that some of us experience was negligence, negligence, abandonment, and rejection. When you have experienced negligence, abandonment, and rejection, you are always afraid to be alone. You can't, you, you can't stand being alone. Silence. Ooh, you can't, something must be on. The TV must be on. The radio must be on. The phone must be active. There's always something that must fill your space because you fear that if I don't hear somebody around, that means I am alone. And people come into your life, and, you, and the first thing you do is time them on the clock. Yep, uh, five, four, three, yep, they're gone. You're expecting people to check out of your life quickly because that was what you experienced as a child. Or when people come into your life, your relationship with them is light because you're, you have already bought their tickets to leave. You expect them to leave, so you never express yourself. You never open yourself up. It's just like, mm -hmm, uh -huh, mm -hmm. weather, talk about weather, talk about politics, talk about uh, the, you know, uh, food. Keep it shallow. <laughs> There's nothing. You will know nothing personal about me because everybody that comes leaves me. So now you begin to expect it. You walk into a room and you expect to be rejected. You already come up with your rejection uh, script. If I go and nobody hugs me, I'm going to sit here. If I sit here and nobody's saying it, I'm going to... Like, you, you, you've already plotted what you're going to say. And so even when someone says, hey, brother, how are you doing? What do you mean, how are you doing? I just came. You, you don't receive love because you are used to being rejected. And if we don't deal with that rejection... You will, you will really be hurting those that love you. You'll be fighting against the very people that are here to love you. The other thing that we have experienced as a child is disappointments, disgrace, and shaming. They always found something wrong with you. Found something wrong to talk about. You were always shamed and you were always belittled. And so you, you, you end up not believing yourself and losing your confidence. I'm being real here, church, because let's not get spiritual about it. We have dealt with a childhood of, of shame and disappointment that, you know, you, you expect to be yelled at when you do something wrong. And when there's no yelling coming, you are like, what's wrong? I mentioned this to you before. One, one lady at my former church, she was working there, and I told her to, to clean something and to arrange something. I'm like, hey, I need this for this meeting, so can you please, um, you know, set the table this way and make sure it's all clean? The human says, why are you talking so soft? Why are you being so gentle? Why? Because uh, it's the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> Gentleness. I mean, I thought I was supposed to be gentle. But what she explained was, move that table over there, set it up for me, and then have my meeting at five. Thank you. That's what she's getting used to, being yelled at, being instructed, and being commanded without affection. And so anybody comes with any level of affection, you are like, uh, what you want? 
or what's your intention? We must deal with that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the last thing I mentioned was fatherlessness, right? 99.9% of the world's trouble is because fathers disappear. Fathers disappear. And when I say disappear, that doesn't mean that they were not there. Some were there, but were not there. <laughs> they, were, they, were, they, were, they were present in body, but absent in spirit. And, and some, of, and some you, will, you, will, you will rather they were not there. Mm. And so that has caused you to have a different role when people say, Abba, Father. Talk about God is my father. Mm -hmm. God is my daddy, whatever. He's my king and my lord and my savior, okay? You can worship God as your father. You can relate to him as father because when you think of father, this is, this is a knot in your tummy. When you, when, you, when you think of father, you have no concept. A child's first God is his father. A child's first God is his father. The father is supposed to be a representation of a heavenly father. And then when the child is old enough, the, the daddy says, come here, my son. Come here, my daughter. Let me introduce you to the great I am that I am. That is what a daddy does. But when daddy is not there and the child is going around wondering what does him, oh God, okay, that there is no personal relationship to that. My daughter says, uh, daddy will make my boo-boo feel better. When my wife says, God will make you feel better, he says, no, daddy will make my boo-boo go away, feel better. That's the first thing. I pray over your life in Jesus' name that whatever curse has passed on of fatherlessness will not be repeated in your life in the name of Jesus. Today it stops. Today it stops. Now that, now that you are getting exposed to it and your understanding is open. I declare um, that men in the house, you will stand. Women in the house, you will embrace this in the mighty name of Jesus. Um, that fatherlessness is over in the name of Jesus. And I pray and I encourage you, have mercy on the fathers. Mm, have mercy on the father. It is, it is, it is not an easy role. It is not an easy responsibility at all. You are the head of the house because when something happens, your head rolls. That's why you are the head of the house. You carry, you carry the responsibility and the weight of the house. And so are all fathers perfect? No. So do your best. Seek God. Put God first. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. Let's go to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 18. Now, I had to build that foundation because, again, as I mentioned to you last week, the plan of the enemy is to pass the curse on. Okay? That's why the enemy is always after the seed. Herod was after the seed, right? It's a, the, the enemy is always after, after the seed. And so we, we have to pass it on. And the enemy wants us to pass on this brokenness. And we must say that, no, I am now in the kingdom of God. And this brokenness stops. This silly cycle of we are all in pain. And my granddaddy did it. And my father did it. And I'm doing it. And my son is doing it. And I see it in my grandson. That got to stop. You just can't say it's okay. It is not okay. You just can't be a believer and say, I have the power of God in my life and tolerate the repetition of a curse. Somebody say amen. Because the power that we get in Christ allows us to break and to snap out of every curse. And so if, if you are watching a curse keep going and you are not doing anything about it, you are, you are you're actually responsible for it. To him that knows the good to do and doesn't do it to him, it is sin. So now you have the power of God in you, the grace of God in you, and by you keep feeding and perpetuating the same cycle of death in your home and in your life. You must stop it. Somebody say amen. The devil's plan is to keep this passing on. That's why Jesus Christ came and, 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 and saved us. Somebody say amen. Go to Genesis. Let's see how it all began. Genesis 18, verse number 18. Genesis 18, verse 18. Bible says that seeing, uh, well, let, let's begin in verse 17, then I'll read. Verse 17 says, and the Lord said, 
shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed in him. I can't hide anything from Abraham because he's going to be this great and mighty nation. Now look at verse 19. He says, For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. So God chooses Abraham because he said, Abraham, you will become a great nation because I know you will teach your children to follow after me. I have chosen Abraham because I know that Abraham will pass on the covenant to his children and his children's children. The responsibility of the blessing passing on is on us. Somebody say amen. I have been redeemed and bought by the blood of Jesus. And now I must pass on to my children an incorruptible seed, a seed that is pure and that can be multiplied to the glory of God. Somebody say amen. Many of us, because we have not dealt with the pain of our own childhood, now pour it into our children. I have not read about this, but I heard about it, um, that, that uh, there, was, there was a second holocaust. And that second holocaust was when the people uh, that went through the holocaust itself began to speak to their children. Don't trust anybody. Watch out for yourself. Don't do this. So fear and, 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 and guilt and shame and, and, and all of that was now being sown to the next generation. Understandably so. After you have been through something, you're like, son, don't go there. If you see a German, run away. That is what was passed on. But little did they know that they were now contaminating the next generation. Because of what you went through, you are passing it on to your children, and now they, they are now repeating it or wondering, how come I am like this? I did not go through the pain you went through, mama. I didn't go through the pain you went through, daddy, but I see the same cycle in my life. If it is not dealt with by the blood of Jesus, if it's not dealt with with prayer and in the presence of God, you will pass it on and people will say, you look just like your daddy. You act just like your mother. So as children of God, it is upon us now to say, now that I am blessed, now that I am called of God, this must end. My brother, the one who came to preach, Frederick, the lawyer, came to America many years ago and sat me down and said, my brother, you are the last born. Notice this in your daddy. It happened in your older brother's life. It happened in my life. My brother, it is coming down the line. Stop it before it gets to you. He became aware of it and began to stand against it. But he says, my brother, I'm not going to wait till it hits you before I tell you. Let me tell you that there is something that is being passed down and that must be stopped. Now, if I do nothing about it, whose fault is it? If I don't change anything about it, after I have been warned that there's a curse coming, then it's my fault. Hallelujah. It is time for us to arise that you know, the power of God that has been given unto us is for us to change our lives. I am not saved for the sweet by and by. I'm not just saved just to go to heaven. I am saved to enforce the kingdom of God on this earth, in my life, in my marriage, in my children. My children will never fight the battles I had to fight. Now, even, even with the warning that was given to me and the preparation that I did for it, I still had to fight. What would have happened if I did nothing? They'd have been run over. And then my children were like, Daddy, I don't know, but uh, at, at this uh, I just had my degree and I don't, I don't know. My life is confused and, and I have no money. That was a curse that was coming down. Well educated, well skilled, but broke. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. You know what goes on in your family. Across, across my, 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 my house in Ghana was a family. And uh, I, it wasn't until later that I observed it that it was a family of women. The father was there, 
the mother was there, and about four daughters were there, and all of the children of the daughters were with the house, were in the house. So they would get married, then come back home with their children. Divorced. They would get married. All of them, there was none exception. All the girls got married, got divorced, and came back home. Coincidence? So if they don't deal with it, then the, 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 the children will pass it on. Even the sons will pass it on. The sons will understand that when we get married, we don't stay together. So why do you expect me to stay married? Because my daddy did not stay with my mother. So why should I stay with you? You can't get spiritual about it. Got to be aware. Be sober and vigilant. Hallelujah. And so God chose Abraham because Abraham will be the one that will pass it on to his children. You are passing something on to your children right now. You are passing something on to your children right now. And if it's not God, stop it. If it is not God, stop it. You have to do the hard work of being in the presence of God and say, Daddy, and there is something wrong. There is something evil that I'm passing on. And Daddy, I stop it right now in the name of Jesus. And Daddy, break me if you have to. And Daddy, shake me if you have to. Uh, but Lord, deal with me. Somebody say amen. Now, you may not have children right now, um, but even then, in your DNA, you are molding an identity. That will pass on. It's almost like a magnet. The moment the child comes, whoop, it just passes on. It's automatic. So whatever you are building now, you are passing on. That's why we do the hard work. That's why we are the adults. That's why we are the parents. That's why we spend time in God's presence. God, break me. And so not allowing God to break you is a selfish act. Not allowing God to deal with you it's a selfish eye because you are all about yourself. You know what? I, I, uh, I'm 35 right now, so I got half, you know, maybe 40 more years. You know, um, I, think, I think I can cope. It's, it's, it's too hard. Really, it will be heard. Ten generations down, what granddaddy did not stop, what grandma did not stop. Hallelujah. God must trust you, or God is entrusting you with the seed of the gospel, with the seed of life that you will pass it on. The easiest way to kill something is in its infancy. Your dreams, your ideas, your calling are being attacked in their infancy. And I know I mentioned this last week, but I want to emphasize it again. And that be careful who you share something with at the, at the beginning. At the beginning of every business idea, at the beginning of, of every dream, at the beginning of every assignment from God, you are not even clear yet. Let it simmer. Let, it, let, it, let, let the baby grow in you. That, that's why I don't get it why in America, the moment somebody gets pregnant, oh my gosh, I'm pregnant. Let the baby take seed. Don't, don't be blasting the pictures of the whatever, how, how do you call that? ultrasound on, on, on Facebook, oh my God, look at me. And then what happens? You see, you see it's, it's, what happens if, if the baby doesn't stay? Then now you are not only depressed and sad about it because it's a, it's a bad thing that's happened, but now you got to tell people it's okay. And not everybody that's smiling and liking it likes it. <laughs> Seriously. Uh-huh. So really, so ah, uh, God, and now they start doing things against you. Don't do that, okay? You can't hide everything. When the baby comes, they will see the baby. People, people back home did not know when my wife was pregnant. I didn't tell my brothers. What, what, what are they going to do? <laughs> if I told them, what, what are they going to do about it? They can't carry it. They are not sending me money for it. They are not feeding the baby. So what? If you are praying for me, keep praying. <laughs> you see, we, we try to involve, because listen, at the infancy, anything happens, it's delicate, it is, it is sensitive. A plant, very young, can be broken over by the wind. Very delicate. A child, very, so keep your delicacy to yourself. Amen? And the second part of, of being careful about this is that you must pray harder. 
when things are in their infancy, you must pray harder for your children because they are unable to stand on their own. They don't have the understanding. They are innocent. So you must fight for them. At the beginning of your business, you must be, I mean, you are praying hard, but at that point you pray harder. Because you are planting and you are fertilizing and you are sowing and you are shielding a first shoot, a second shoot, and then you stake it and then you protect it with a net. You, you, you shield it. Hallelujah. And so whatever God has put inside of you at the beginning of it, don't think it's going to be easy. Because if you think it's easy, when it gets just a little hard, you get discouraged. Oh my God, what's going on? No, it is the beginning of something. The beginning of everything is hard. It's easier to roof a building than to do a foundation. Foundation, you got to dig, you got to dig, and then find a bedrock and make sure it's solid, and then pound, pound, and then level, and then pound, and it's, it's work. Roofing is douche, 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 ah, douche, douche, douche. It's nice. It's pretty. The foundation no one sees. So the hard work is going to come at the beginning. So don't be sloppy. Don't expect things to just work out because you just told somebody about it. And especially when you get a, a prophetic word, oh, that word is a tiny, tiny, tiny little baby. A prophetic word is not fulfilled. A prophetic word is a seed that you must sow and work through and pray through until it's manifest. Somebody say amen. Come on, turn to your neighbor and tell them, I will arise. And I will pray. Hallelujah. There is, there, is, there is something that God wants us to pass on. And that is powerful. We will not allow the enemy to steal it from us. Amen. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. Your daddy loves you. You know that? Your God loves you. 2 Kings chapter 5. And we have all been through something in our life that was rough, that, that, that was not okay. But there's something about the redemptive power of Jesus. Somebody say amen. And, and as, we, as, we, as we end this discussion, I want you to remember this. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 7. Actually, verse, verse 7 talks about Naaman, you know, a general of Syria coming to Elisha. And uh, let's jump all the way to verse number 10. 2 Kings 5 verse 10 says, And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But then Naaman got mad and said, How can you let me dip in the Jordan when, it's, when I have better rivers? And listen, bro, it's not about what it looks like. It's about the power. Mm. Mm. Okay, that will preach. Let's move on. Jump to verse number 14. And so he is convinced now to go dip in the Jordan. Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. He completed the process according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. Yet again, we see the restoration of childhood. The restoration of that which was, was, was damaged and, 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 um, and destroyed, now being, destroy, uh, now being restored back to that of a child. One thing I want you to remember after this day, and that whatever you are going through, whatever you have been through as a child, it is not too difficult and it's not too horrible that my Jesus cannot redeem it. There is nothing you have been through. There is nothing you have been through. There's nothing you are going through. Uh, daddy not been there. Uh, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, uh, mental abuse. There's nothing that you have suffered. Rejection, the pain. None of that can be compared to the power of God. There is nothing so damaging um, that Jesus cannot restore uh, back to what it was supposed to be. Somebody say amen. Naaman's body was, he was an old, I mean he... He was a general, and so he must have been a very old man who had fought in the military and then gained the round of general. So he has been around for a little bit, and then uh, uh, he has this leprosy on his skin, um, but, but he comes, he dips in the Jordan uh, seven times, and he's made completely whole, and his skin becomes that of a baby. 
How many of you want to dip in the Jordan seven times? Oh. Hey, yeah, yeah, we all do, right? The fountain of youth, right? Forget Mary Kay. Let's go to the Jordan. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to dip 14 times. Hey, one for now, one for next year. Hallelujah. Amen. But he, they were, they were, his skin was totally and completely restored like that of a baby. Somebody say amen. And so Jesus Christ is able to restore and to transform your story. Somebody say amen. Your testimony will be great and there will be no evidence of your pain. Anything that was shame to you will become your glory in the name of Jesus. Begin to picture right now, every eye closed, begin to picture right now, the very thing that was your pain, the very thing that was your shame, the very thing that was a burden, uh, uh, but the blood of Jesus Christ uh, is now a mighty testimony to the glory of God, uh, um, that God has healed that relationship, and God has restored, uh, and God has transformed, uh, and made it completely well. Hallelujah. Begin to see that in the life of your children. The very thing that was a burden, the very thing that, that, that was a yoke is now being removed in the name of Jesus. I pray over your life that there shall be no evidence of that pain in the name of Jesus. I declare that you will think about it and it will not have any power over you. You will think about it and it will have no weight upon your life in the name of Jesus. See, it is called the power of a memory. You can open your eyes now. It is called the power of a memory. You know what? I can think about something and it have impact on me. But then I can think on something and it have no impact on me at all. Somebody say amen. It is all based on the power that I give it. Amen. And so may the power of that curse, may the power of that pain, may the power of that memory uh, that seeks to bring you down uh, be destroyed in the name of Jesus. May the power of God go deep into your heart and heal you of that abandonment and that fear and that rejection in the mighty name of Jesus. Uh, may you be made totally and completely whole in the name of Jesus. Completely whole to the point that you can see that person or go to that location or go to that house and still rejoice in the Lord and still have no pain about it. You know, people say, you know what, I hope I forget. You will never forget. You will never forget. You know, your mind is too sharp to forget stuff. But it will have no power over you. I remember it, but okay, it happened. Part of my history. Let's move yes. on. May the Lord bring you to that place. Amen. But remember that there is nothing that you have been through that is not redeemable. There is nothing you have been through that is, there is nothing. Is there anything too hard for my God? Oh, death, where is your sting? Death has no power. And so if death has no power, then whatever you went through, though it felt like death, it's not able to hold you down because my Jesus has overcome death. And the grave. Yeah. Death was supposed to kill you. The grave was supposed to bury you. Uh, but both he overcame. Hallelujah. And so you are going to be healed and restored and strengthened. And guess what? You are going to become the new pillar of a new covenant. Yeah. Hallelujah. In your house and in your family, you are now going to become the new pillar and say that was our history. And by family, we are changing directions and we are going a different way. And because I am restored by the blood of Jesus. The greatest lie of the enemy is that what you are going through is, is, is greater than what God can do. The enemy says, you know what, uh, you can't help it. It just overwhelms you. No, it will no longer overwhelm you. Somebody say amen. The second thing I want you to remember, the first thing is that nothing you have been through can, can be, um, nothing you have been through cannot be healed. Everything you have been through, no matter how bad, can be healed and restored by Jesus. Second one, let's go to Matthew. Matthew, because we can spend time, I can spend time teaching you on the, on the, on the, on the effects of broken childhood. 
Okay, and this is what happens when your child was broken and, and fatherlessness and you know, rejection. We, they are, the symptoms are unlimited. And so we can spend forever there, but we don't want to spend forever there because Jesus Christ has made us whole. Somebody say amen. I came to Jesus and I love him because he's the, he, he is my answer to every pain. My mind, my emotions, my life, Jesus is my answer. So if I come to him, he will wash it all away. Somebody say amen. Matthew chapter 2, Matthew 2, verse 16. Ha, yada barusti yande. Now, 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 hear this, hear this, hear this. Uh, and now, because I can, I can hear some of you saying, uh, but it takes time. Yes, it takes time. <clears throat> it takes time. But the healing that I'm talking about is not one of time. The healing is, I am healed, therefore I walk out my healing. It is not, I am walking towards my healing, oh my God. No, no, no. You overcome by the blood. I have overcome. I am healed. Now, Lord, teach me how to walk out my wholeness. Somebody say amen. That must be your confidence. If you come from, I'm working towards it, you will never get there because man's righteousness is as filthy rags before God. It will never meet the cost of sacrifice. But when you receive it completely, Jesus... I'm all yours. Heal me, make me whole. Then with that confidence, you can move forward and say it is well. Yes. Somebody say amen. Yes. Matthew chapter 2, verse number 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise man, was exceedingly angry. Mm. And he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all his districts from two years old and under according to the time where he had determined for the wise men. Verse 17. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because there are no more. And so Herod is now upset that he's been deceived. And he says, guess what? I'm going to kill all the children within a 10-mile radius. Completely all the boy children. Go. I mean, I know one of them will be that Jesus that they're talking about. His plan was to completely kill Jesus as an infant. He decided it's easier to fight the battle when the boy is a baby and than fight him when he's an adult. When there are issues in your life, it is better you deal with them now before they blow up. Somebody say amen. Right now, it is just a little seed. It has no root. I put that thing, crush that thing, destroy it before it starts getting roots. And then 10 years down the road, it's under your house breaking the foundation, and you are wondering, how did this happen? Because that seed, that oak was allowed to grow. Kill it in its infancy. Any sin, any attitude, kill it. Kill it, because eventually it will bear fruit. Somebody say amen. And so Herod's plan was to destroy Jesus when he, when he was a child. That was the same plan the enemy had for you. Please remember that the enemy had a plan to take you out. Whatever you went through was not just for entertainment. Whatever you went through was supposed to kill you. The thief came back not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's the plan of the enemy, to kill you. What happened in your marriage? What happened as a child? What happened in your mind? The whole point was to kill your emotion, kill your mind, kill your marriage, and completely destroy your life. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. When my mother conceived me, she had an ectopic pregnancy. And it was to the point where it was either she lived or I lived. And after uh, being the last of seven children, yeah, bro, man, you can go. <laughs> because there was no way they were going to sacrifice my mother who was going to watch other kids. I came nine years after my brother. No, we, are, we, are, we have had enough, okay? It's okay. We love you, but if there was a choice to be made, they would have preserved the life of mother. And then she goes to church, and there's a prophetic word, something, and then boom, here I am. I'm still here. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to encourage you that the fact that you are still here, the fact that you are here right now, 
is evidence that what Herod tried to do did not work. It's evidence that what the enemy tried to do to shut you down and to destroy you. I don't love God anymore. I don't love Jesus anymore. I am dying. That is not working right now. And so rejoice in the Lord because you are still standing. You are still standing here. The enemy meant to take you out, but here you are. Devil, you missed again. It did not work. Hallelujah. Uh, that must be your confidence that as I go forward and I'm putting all the things in the past healed by the blood, as I go forward, I go for saying the devil missed another one. Whoa, 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 oh, devil. No, you missed again. Rejoice him that I am an overcomer. Yeah. You can't allow yourself to fall back in that, oh my God, they tried to kill me. And oh my God, I would have. But you did not die. Yeah. You were here. So stop moping and stop whining about yesterday. Paul said that one thing I do is forgetting what lies behind. I press on towards the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If we all want to talk about our sorrows, tissues will be not enough. This place will be full of water. Talking about our pain and our sorrow. And it is real. We, no one is discounting your pain. My pain is real. Your pain is real. Uh, but Jesus Christ uh, has kept us from death. Oh, yeah. Jesus has preserved you. So may you arise and be strong in the Lord. No weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. Every tongue that will rise up against me, I'm going to shut you down. I condemn it in the name of Jesus. Let the victory of God arise in you. Stop walking like you are dead. Stop behaving like you are defeated. You are not defeated. You are alive. The intent was to kill you, but you checked and you pinched yourself and you are still here. Glory be to God. Glory be to my God that I am still alive. And so I'm going to go forward and do the work of my God. Somebody say amen. Amen. What the enemy meant to destroy you did not. Oh, my God. The enemy thought he could destroy. He could destroy the work of God in my life. Oh, it was a low point. He thought he could destroy the work of God in my life. But I'm still standing. Listen, if there was no church right now, I'll be at the corner of the street somewhere declaring that Jesus is Lord. You will find me in Zimbabwe right now and sharing the gospel. No, 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 no. I shall live and not die. Yes. Yes. I shall live and not die. So your childhood may have been rough. Your experiences may have been difficult. Uh, but in the name of Jesus, you are redeemed by the blood. And now you will live and not die. Don't let death be even a thought. I am alive today. Oh, Greater work shall we do, for I know the thoughts I think towards you, plans to give you a hope and a future. There are greater things ahead, more things ahead. Papa said, the Lord is perfecting and that which concerneth me. And so whilst he was forming me in my mother's womb, things got a little tricky. Hey, but I survived. And here I am. As I was growing, the enemy tried to kill me. Hey, but here I am. And the enemy tried to suppress me, but I escaped. I am here today. I am here today, and I will move forward in the power of God. I will move forward in the glory of my God. I will move forward in the victory of my King. Somebody say amen. Let that be your identity. You can't, you can't play with it. Oh, it's, it's okay to feel sad. It is not okay to feel sad. The Bible says that rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice in the Lord always. And, and, and what, does, what does rejoice mean? Look up, jump up, and spin around. Hey, rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice because you are still standing. See, you are, you, are, you, are, you are a deadly weapon. You are more dangerous to the enemy than you think you are. You are more victorious than you feel like. No, look at your life story. How many people have gone through what you've been through and are still in their right mind? Or are still even serving Jesus? How many people have been through what you went through 
in your marriage, on your job, but are still moving on. There is something about the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus. I want to share this, this quickly with you. God says, I see you and I know you. He says, I see you and I know you. Because all things are working together for your good. Don't hate your childhood. The days of hating it are over. Don't, because it was, it was terrible. It was horrible. But the enemy will always want you to live your life looking back. And you never, you just always running into, oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, okay. But you're always looking back at the wrong. May it be behind you in the name of Jesus. Don't hate your childhood. It was horrible. It was terrible. It was mean. It shouldn't have been. Things happened. But, in the, but thank God I am saved. Thank God I am redeemed by the blood. Now I'm charging forward. And, no one, and this is what um, Reinhard Bonnke said. I'll make the devil pay for it. For every pain and suffering that he caused you as a child, or oh, make him pay for it. Laugh and praise the Lord. Uh, confuse him with the praise and uh, with the dance. When it's like, what? I thought you were supposed to be dead. How did you come out? Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Let him pay for it. Redeeming your childhood. Make it a motivation. Embrace it as part of your story. The key thing I want to share with you here is this. Is the cross of Calvary. What did Jesus say on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Nobody is perfect. Daddy was imperfect. With all his crazy self, he was imperfect. Even daddy that was perfect was imperfect. Said some things, did some things. Mommy was imperfect. Uncle, auntie was imperfect. Right? Husband wasn't perfect. Wife wasn't perfect. Things happened. So can we embrace the cross? Because that's the only way you can overcome it. Trying to overcome this with, with, with sessions and counseling doesn't work. Temporary band-aid. It's a hard issue. It's, it's, it's not here. <laughs> it's here. The pain is here. So I can give you good examples. Oh my God, I feel better today. Okay. <laughs> It'll come back because it's here. The root. Remember, you must deal with the root in order to affect the fruit. You can't deal with the branches and say, oh, it's gone. Because eventually, if there's a root, a new tree will grow. And the root of it is the cross. And so would you, I invite you today, because you know that there is nothing you have been through that Jesus cannot heal, cannot redeem, and that because of Christ, you are alive today and the devil has missed on destroying your life. Can we step into the cross and say this boldly? Father, I forgive them, for they know not what they did. If you don't do that, it will always cripple you. If you don't do that, then you have not been to the cross. You can talk all the good Bible verses and talk all the good excitements and all the good declarations you can do. But until you have come to the cross and say, Jesus, what you did on the cross, I see myself in you. And I say, Lord God, just like you, I forgive them for they know not what they did. Because, you know, what they did was evil. But the Bible says that God made man perfect. But man has gone after his own devices. It was the work of the enemy. It was the work of the devil. It was, it was the work of the enemy. Even if you thought they were in their right mind when they did it, still was the plan of the enemy because his plan is, the plan of God is to give you life, life more abundant. So whatever pain happened, I challenge you this morning. Let's go to the cross. I cannot give you anything by the cross. I cannot preach to you anything by Jesus. Not the counseling, not a coaching motivation, none of that. None of that will heal the pain. None of that will, will make you say that once I was lost, but now I'm found. The only thing that can make you say, yesterday is gone, another day has come, do something new in my life. That happens at the cross. 
that happens at the cross. And at the cross, it's not just saying Jesus died. It is you saying, Father, forgive them. Can we do that? Because you are alive. You, have, you only have great things ahead of you right now. You only have victory ahead of you right now. You only have the glory of God ahead of you right now. So don't even worry about how they feel. I want them to feel the pain. I, I, I don't care how you feel. You do yourself. I am moving forward. I am going to rejoice in the Lord. I am going to celebrate Jesus. I am going to, one thing I do is forgive you. Guess what? One thing I, I don't want to do is drag your crazy self with me into my destiny. If I don't forgive you, I have to bring you along to every place of increase God has me. There's no room for you in the inn. You can stay where you are. I forgive you. You do what you got to do. But that's your choice. Would you say, Father, forgive them. Father, I forgive them. I wish that they do well. I wish that they are blessed. Lord, save them. Please save them. As I carry on with you.